I'm Jenna Siri, a bookseller and associate producer of Poured Over, and today I am joined by Jennifer Ackerman, the incredible author of many books about birds. You probably remember The Genius of Birds or The Bird Way, which was a BN Best of 2020 for Nature and Wildlife. But today we will be talking about what an owl knows. This book truly changed my perspective on birds, maybe in general. I learned so much from just this one book. I can't believe it. So Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us today. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jenna. I love this book. I think there's so much value in sort of this dissection of one species. There's so much from the start to finish of how these birds exist in our society and the impact they have. But I'd really love to start with talking about how you came to birds and how this all this journey started for you. Yeah. So, um, gosh, oh, I've loved birds really since I was a kid. And I went bird watching with my father when I was seven or eight years old. And we would go down along the CNO Canal in Washington, D.C. And we go, you know, before dawn and we go out and listen to the to the birds sing. The thing is, I was one of um, five girls in my family. My dad was a really busy guy. And if you wanted to spend time alone with him, Bird watching was a great way. And um, he had learned to bird watch from a when he was a Boy Scout. And uh, he'd learned from a man who was really almost blind, but he had a wonderful ear. So my dad learned about bird song very, very early in his life. And he really passed that along to me. And so, you know, from the age of seven or eight, I've just been, I've been a bird lover all my life. You know, it was only later when I got interested as a science writer, really, in birds and bird behavior and bird brains and what, you know, what's, what makes birds tick? How do they communicate? You know, how do they learn their songs? There were a whole slew of questions came to me as a, as a science writer. So that really launched me into, to birds. I think people, anyone who knows me is going to be very confused by me doing this interview because I have to say, I have a bit of a fear of birds. Maybe that's just living in New York and um, being around pigeons, which seem to have no fear or regard for human life. But this, I have to say, this book started to change my mind, which I didn't think was truly possible on birds. I learned so much about the beauty of these creatures and how they are so important to our ecosystem. I guess the next question I would have would be why owls specifically? How did you end up on this particular topic? Yes. Well, so I do love birds, you know, all birds really. They're, but owls, you know, they're just so unique in the bird world. Um, for one thing, you know, most of them are nocturnal. They're these night hunters and they have such like beautiful, eerily quiet flight and these really extraordinary senses that allow them to um, navigate the night and to to hunt in the night. And I I had a few early experiences with owls. Um, I put up an owl box behind my kitchen uh, window and I would, <laughs> I was lucky enough to get an Eastern screech owl roosting in that box. And just as little head would show out of the, the, the little circle in the box during the day. And then at night it would vanish. Sometimes it, in the morning I would find <laughs> like a Oh, the wing of a bird hanging out of the box part way, you know, and the, and this owl would, I, I would see the wing sort of twitch, twitch, and then it would be pulled into the box by the owl. So anyway, I just got really fascinated. Um, and when I started to think about writing a book about owls, you know, my head just, just began to sizzle with questions because like, what makes an owl an owl? And, and how did these birds get to be the way they are? You know, why are they so different from from other birds? Why are they active at night? You know, they have this reputation for, for being wise, but really how smart are they? How intelligent? And I really wanted to um, explore these questions and find out what we actually know about owls. As it turns out, we know quite a lot. You know, we've been studying them for a very long time. But it's really only lately that um, there have been the kind of advances, some of the um, technological breakthroughs that really have allowed us to solve some of the mysteries that have been around for centuries. And that made it a very good time to write the book. I could not believe how many kinds of owls there were. Just that sheer fact alone, the, just constantly hearing about more and more variations was 
honestly shocking to me in a way because you just don't think that there's that much diversity. Yeah, there is incredible diversity. You know, there are 260 species of owls. They're all over the world. They live on every continent except Antarctica. They live in every kind of habitat. Um, you know, from deserts to to ice packs, from uh, boreal forests to to grasslands, and they range tremendously in size too. You you um you go from something like the blackest and fish owl, which is a very rare owl, and it's as big as a fire hydrant. You know, it's huge, and it's this really kind of silly looking bird with these tousled little um, ear tufts and and a funny little way of kind of swaggering when it walks. And then all the way down in size to the elf owl, which is this little tiny um, nugget of a bird about the size of a pine cone, you know, and they also are incredibly diverse in their behaviors. So you have some owls that are active only at night, some that are active in the dawn and the dusk, the crepuscular hours, and then some that are really mainly active in the daytime. So there's a, a just a tremendous range. I love any book that's going to send me on a Google um, deep dive rabbit hole. And this book absolutely did. Uh, my search history recently is just types of owls because as I was reading it, I just couldn't stop. The um, the Blackestons fish owl might be my new favorite thing. They're so, they look so grumpy all the time. And there's just all these pictures of them being held by people looking just so truly disgruntled and confused. I I love it. They they are really amazing birds. And I had the incredible good fortune to see one years and years ago when I was in uh, Hokkaido. I was doing a story for National Geographic on winter wildlife. And at the time, this was like 20 years ago, I really had no idea what I was seeing. I mean, these birds are so rare and they're so magnificent. And um, I was with a a scientist who studies them, Sumiyama Yamamoto, and he's a worked very hard to conserve these birds because there are so few of them left. But I saw the bird from a distance in in a tree. And I mean, it it really looked enormous. I couldn't believe it. It was that it was that it was a bird. You know, it's just a it's a magnificent creature, truly. And the Japanese have such reverence for it. it. It's one of those things that I was like, I can't believe I've gone so long without knowing about these. But now I'm just I'm obsessed. I can't. And hearing the conservation efforts around these some of these more rare birds it was so interesting. The researchers who are out there doing this work across so many different fields um, it's incredible the amount of commitment and dedication that these people have for these these species, for their their habitats. What was it like to get to work with these um, researchers and these people who are so passionate? Well, you know, it's my favorite thing in all the world. It's why I do this work. I just love getting out in the field with somebody who's completely obsessed with their bird. And I have to say, owl people are in a special category all their own. I mean, they are truly crazy and obsessed and, you know, wonderfully dedicated. I went out in the field with some of the really some of the best owl experts in the world. And it was absolutely incredible to see them at work and to see the way how comfortable they are with these birds. These are some of the hardest birds in the world to study. And um, they're very shy. You know, they're most of them are active at night. It's very hard to access some of their field sites. So you have to be really dedicated and, you know, motivated and rigorous to get out there and do the kind of work that they that they do. And it was it was so inspiring. You know, some of them go out, you know, all night long and they're listening for owl calls. They're trying to to locate pairs and in some cases trying to to trap these birds and so that they can band them or measure them. And they're very difficult to to trap, to get either. They're so wary. They're so shy. So you have to be very clever and very skilled, um, you know, in order to do the kind of work that they do. And it's just I just found it incredibly inspiring and and also just daunting. I mean, <laughs> truly, the the one that struck me the most was all of the the researchers who are working with the, the owl calls. And there's uh, like a former musician who it tracks these birds and can identify them just by the the sounds they make. And some of these researchers almost seem to speak directly to the birds. It was so incredible to imagine being so immersed with these creatures that you can actually make calls and responses with them. I was blown away. 
Yeah, that is an amazing thing. And, you know, one of the most surprising things I think I found in the book was that um, that, that the vocalizations of owls are so complex. They're just teeming with meaning. You know, we used to think that a, a hoot was just a hoot, but owls have all different kinds of hoots. They have, they also squawk, they chitter. And all of these different kinds of vocalizations in one species that that was studied, the great horned owl, there are 15 different types of vocalizations. And, you know, there's six kinds of hoots and five kinds of chitters. And, and each of them is used in a specific context with a specific meaning. And I, too, was just absolutely bowled over by the way these scientists who study vocalization have really made themselves experts on owl language. And you mentioned um, the musician Marion Savelsberg is Dutch. She studied as, uh, as a classical musician. And she has used her very, very skilled ear to um, identify individual owls by their calls. And this is what scientists have learned is that owls have a, like a signature call, just, you know, a very distinctive voice that identifies them. And they use, they can recognize each other by voice. So they, they use it to identify um, mates and allies and strangers. But humans can, if they can identify individual birds in the wild, they can tell um, two things. First of all, it's really helpful with conservation. It's a great tool because you can actually start to count birds once you recognize them as individuals much more accurately. And also it gives the, it gives you a window into their very complicated social lives. Um, and you like figure out who's mating with whom. And it turns out, you know, we thought that, that owls were these, you know, monogamous creatures faithful to their mates. Well, it turns out there's a there's a lot of hanky panky going on. It's a real soap opera out there. Yeah, and, um, and these scientists are able to um, to tune into this and to to see you know who's swapping mates with whom, when and why, just because of this capacity to uh, to recognize voices. I was very impressed with sort of the level of commitment that all of these researchers have to something that. You know, I imagine most people are like, oh, owls, you know, it's birds. It's it's, you know, that's great. But they're in these ecosystems that they inhabit. They're these super predators. They're these like super important pieces of so many of the ecosystems. And there I was in, amazed by how often they were like, well, there's 30 of these birds that we know of. And these researchers know all 30 of these birds. And it's it's mind-blowing that it's that small in so yeah. many cases. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of, especially island species, you know, they they get down to very um, low numbers and, and you know, the great conservation efforts going into these birds. It really, owls everywhere are, are threatened by habitat loss and climate change. So these are really important efforts. And I think one of the very cool aspects of this is that there are huge numbers of citizen scientists, people who are volunteering to do some of this really important conservation work. And they're, you know, <laughs> these are like heart surgeons and nurses who work in the ER and all kinds of people. And they are, you know, volunteering their time and their effort, sometimes working all night long to trap owls and ban them and to try to contribute to this effort to understand the numbers of owls, you know, where, what habitats they're using and, and also how they're moving, you know, owls migrate. And we didn't know very much about that until we got these, some of these really big networks in place that are, for the most part, um, run by, you know, volunteers, these people who are just, just giving their time because they love owls. And I love that. I love that sort of community aspect of it. It's so great to, to hear about and to imagine. As daunting as I'm sure all that is for the researchers, is it daunting for you to sit down with all of the, this massive amounts of research I'm sure you've compiled and be like, okay, now I need to turn it into the book? How does it go from here are all my notes, here are all the things I've compiled, and now I have to write it? Yeah, it's um, it's the most exciting thing. And it's also, yes, very daunting. And so it takes, so I, I usually spend a year or two in the field and reading, interviewing, doing research for the book. And then it's another year or two of writing, editing, you know, draft after draft after draft. 
And sometimes the amount of material really just is overwhelming and the chapters kind of balloon. But editing the, you know, the extraneous out, um, sculpting, crafting the narrative, that's really a joyful experience for me. I love um, I love the storytelling aspect of it and focusing on that. And I and I like to imagine that I'm writing a letter to a, an interested friend, you know, then that really just helps me sort out kind of what's essential to the story, what's interesting. And what I can just leave on the the cutting room floor. The commentary aspect along with the facts really makes it go so much more smoothly. I never, it never feels like homework. It never feels like you're reading a textbook. It's just, I think a letter to a friend is like a great way to describe it because it just feels so conversational and so easy to digest, unlike an owl pellet. (laughs) Well, thank you very much. If you if you don't know about owl pellets, you got to read the book, I guess. But oh my gosh, I mean, I, yeah, they they so an owl pellet is all the indigestible parts <laughs> of its prey, and it, it is really a marvel how this works. You know, the owls eat their prey uh, whole sometimes, and um, you know they they end up with all the claws and the fur and the beaks and all kinds of stuff that they can't digest, and it's all of that is compressed in their stomachs, and then they um, eject it up through their esophagus. And it's really quite a em- remarkable process. It's um, it's something that the pterosaurs could do in the dinosaur age, also. But it, it, it and you and it's one of the ways that scientists find owls is really by tracking down their pellets. They're all over the forest floor. If you could, if you find them and you've got a bunch around a tree, you can look up and be pretty sure that there there's an owl roosting in that tree. As in the grand scheme of birds, these feel truly like one step from dinosaurs so often with so many of their like really distinct traits. It's crazy to imagine that these birds are similar to like songbirds because they seem so drastically different. They really do. You know, they, they all birds are dinosaurs. You know, they all arose from these um, small running predatory dinosaurs, but they all took different branches of in, in evolution. I think it's just fascinating that that owls, you know, they seized on a niche that was occupied after the big dinosaurs died off and small mammals began to explore different niches, including like shrews and opossums that were became night mammals and owls adapted, you know, and they uh, developed these incredible um, sensory powers, quiet flight, things that allowed them um, to uh, operate at, at night and take advantage of this new nocturnal feast. They really have enchanted well, me clearly from the way I have grown from reading this book, but they've enchanted humans from cave drawings through now. I was, I couldn't believe that we have found pictures of owls in cave drawings. That seems, and that they're like recognizably distinct owls. Truly they're, um, there's a, the oldest, one of the oldest known images of a bird is this painting in the in the Chauvet Cave of southeastern France, and it's 36,000 years old, and it is clearly an owl. They think it's either a Eurasian eagle owl or a long-eared owl. And so, you know, we humans have been obsessed with, with owls for literally tens of thousands of years. We, we've been shoulder to shoulder with them for, for you know, most of our, our evolution and development. And so, you know, it's really interesting to me that they they are kind of lodged in the human imagination in just a, a very pronounced way that's not necessarily true of, of other kinds of birds. They represent so many different things. As I was reading through the ways that different cultures view them, every time something else would come up, I'd be like, of course, I've heard that. Yes, I recognize. But then there are things in other cultures that are so you know, in in some cultures, there are omens of good luck and some there are omens of bad luck. They, right. There's symbols of death or witchcraft. But then and also there are also symbols of wisdom and prophecy. They really run the gamut of every possible connection. Absolutely. And, you know, it's it's really interesting to me. I, I've been sort of trying to parse what well, what is it about owls that's that that they carry such powerful symbolic value. And I I think it's really a combination of things um, that makes these birds so potent as symbols. You know, we see part of it is that we see ourselves in them. You know, they have these round heads and big forward facing eyes. And, you know, some species are just kind of cute. They're baby like, you know, but they're also so different from us. You know, they're these creatures of the night. They're really fierce hunters. 
they're just mysterious and kind of uncanny. So I think it's this 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 whole package of of owls as you know familiar and strange and sometimes cute, sometimes brutal that makes them so kind of exciting and also troubling in a way. They really have fit in so many different pieces of mythology and pieces of superstition and the way that they're they've intertwined with so many different cultures of, you know, they've they're seen as symbols of death in so many different societies. Mm-hmm. And then at the same time, in so many other societies, they're revered and they're these good luck symbols. And it's so interesting that this specific type of bird, which even though they can look so varied from the different species, has managed to sort of constantly flow through these different um, cultures, these different societies. It's it. I could I wasn't prepared to read all those things. I think I was like, this is truly something I never thought about. Yeah, it's really really interesting. Um, it, they're in our myths, our stories, our art and artifacts. They're 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 everywhere. And one of the things that that you know interested me was well, so why are they so um, closely linked with death? You know, they're in some societies, and it's not really hard to understand how a you know the catching a barn owl out of the corner of your eye, this ghostly white bird with its these strange kind of funereal night cries, and it, their habit of of like haunting vacant buildings and cemeteries and and things that that might give rise to the notion of some kind of like bird like incarnation of a of a demon or a spirit being of some kind. Um, So, you know, there's that. And there's also an interesting idea that owls are linked with death because of our own circadian rhythms. So a lot of times um, cardiac events like stroke, heart attack, those kinds of things, they occur in the very, very early morning hours. And that's, you know, around 3 or 4 a.m., and um, it's kind of when our our body is at an ebb in a way, and our, our levels of adrenaline are low, and all those kinds of things. And you know, uh, it's also the time that you know if you if you're awake and going outside, you're going to see owls. So there is this link between them that that I think is is um, is pretty interesting. And I was also fascinated with just the way they appear in artwork across the ages, mm-hmm. you know, from the. Egyptians all the way to um, some contemporary, beautiful contemporary sculptures. One of my favorites is one by Teresa White, who has a sculpture of a snowy owl on the back of a lemming. And it's really uh, meant to represent the yuppic understanding of the interrelationship of creatures in the natural world. And their kind of spirit being it. I just want to mention that there are photographs and illustrations in the book. This is the first time I've ever done that. And it was really fun to find uh, good pictures of some of the artwork of owls and some of the great photographs to uh, to include. That definitely was. I only have a galley here. I can't wait to get my hands on the finished one because even just the, the pictures in the galley are so, they add so much because every time I was like, I got to Google what that owl looks like because that's how I read books. But then I would turn the page and there would be the owl and it would be okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it really adds so much. I think the thing that gets that really struck me in the um, way we understand owls in our society and our culture is just this constant curiosity about nature and mm-hmm. how even in, as society constantly grows and changes and unfortunately we are experiencing so much habitat loss for these creatures, there are still so many people who have this curiosity and this love for these creatures and for nature in general and how important that is to maintain. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. You know, and I, and I um I think especially during the pandemic that people really did turn to nature for as a source of comfort, and that has always been true for me. I remember I really started after my mother died. I was twenty one, and and I found a place, um, a little mountain, and uh, had a path that went up to this absolutely beautiful view of um, a meander in a river. And there was just something about that place, about being really deep in nature. You know, there was pine needle smell everywhere and rotting logs and, you know, moss covered rocks and all the birds and everything. And I just found so much comfort in this idea of living things going about their lives in a very regular way. You know, they were so resilient, so persistent. And 
So in some ways, I, you know, I think I found in nature the kind of the same appeal that I find in books, which is, you know, that it's deeply engrossing. Both are deeply engrossing. They're both filled with these rich particularities. And they're also, I don't know, mysteriously universal. And, and they, they offer perspective. It's so easy now to feel disconnected, I think, from the world as a whole. At a time where we are at our once our most global that we've ever been, it's so easy to be isolated in our day-to-day lives. And especially for things like an owl that, you know, I live in New York City. I may never really encounter very many wild owls outside of the fair few in Central Park, but it's so different to be able to access that and to really understand not only just the conservation efforts or the new research, but just the way that something like a a species of bird can connect culture across. It does make you feel connected and in both to uh, the birds themselves and to, to, yeah, people across the globe. And, you know, I have found that uh, everywhere I go, for one thing, there's, there are owl things, there is owl Mm -hmm. merchandise everywhere, you know, there are owl beers and owl wine and you know, owl backpacks, and they're really a thing in in cultures everywhere. You know, the only place you don't see those those kinds of of items, and they don't see it in the artwork artwork, is where people associate owls with with bad luck and death, and so they don't they don't want them on their right. God's backpack. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so interesting. Like you said during the pandemic, I mean, I have so many friends that were like, "I'm into birding now. This is my new thing. I'm I'm into birds." And they go out and it really gave them that opportunity to connect. And I think that that's such an important thing to have, that renewed sense of nature. Whenever I go back to Minnesota now, I'm, that's where I'm originally from, and I really have such a different respect for the nature than I had growing up. Because when you sort of grow up around it, sometimes you're like, oh, this is just what everywhere is like. But now there's an owl center in Minnesota that I'm determined to visit. I'm trying to regain that respect for the nature. Yeah, it it is um it is really something. I remember during the pandemic, a friend of mine had a barred owl family living in the woods behind her. And that's how we spent time together. We we take walks, you know, wandering around looking for the nest, listen, li- listening for the barred owl and um we we heard the owls but we never actually saw them. These birds are so elusive and difficult to spot, but it was the it was the hunt. It was, you know, just the company and, and the possibility of seeing this magical creature that really, it really kept us going. It, it is one of those like pure basic human things is that desire to understand the world around us. And especially now when there's so many scientific advancements, I couldn't believe reading in the book sort of the ways that they're using technology now to understand these birds in a different way that now it seems like we're like on the precipice especially with all these conservation efforts really to understand so much more and not just for owls but for animal species across the across the map this is really true i mean we have um so many new technologies you know i think about um nest cams and webcams that are teaching us what's going on at a nest or um, camera traps in the wilderness that are taking pictures of animals at night and, and you know in remote areas. So we're learning things from um, that technology that that about the kind of intermittent interactions between creatures at uh, birds at a nest. Or I think about like satellite telemetry, the ability to put a satellite um, tracking device on a bird to d- figure out where it's going and. And we can do that now with a big bird like a snowy owl. Um, and, you know, there are infrared cameras. There's um, machine learning that's helping us with the vocalizations. There's just so much great new technology. And, you know, a lot of the the, the owl researchers will tell you that there's nothing like going out in the field, getting your boots dirty and really, you know, doing it the old fashioned way. And and that is also just absolutely essential. Those people are doing the, these long term studies that take tremendous dedication and take being out in the field where the owls are. And uh, we can't, we can't learn without those those kinds of people. And and having hopefully, you know, in these sort of, in the wake of this renewed interest, hopefully we have a new crop of people coming up that are ready to take on those responsibilities. Like you were saying, even the sort of crowdsourcing that's happening of whether it's people coming in on their off time or people watching. I remember so many people watching um, like live stream webcams of different nests and 
reporting back to researchers because they're able to be there all the time. There's always someone online. And so all of that stuff is so sort of encouraging and hopeful for these research teams going forward. Absolutely. That's a great point. And and a lot of these webcams, you know, people are watching all the time and they're documenting behaviors and then you've got it on film so they can, you know, say, you know, I think at such and such an hour, this happened and the scientists can go back and look. And sure enough, you know, there have been some really incredible breakthroughs that way. So, yeah, it's um, it's it's fantastic. What a way to build community through all of this and just have that connection of, you know, we all love these owls. I think especially a sort of a group of animals that doesn't always necessarily get the same recognition. We hear, you know, a lot of save the turtles and save the polar bears, which absolutely we want to save all of the animals, but I couldn't believe how many different species of owls I had never realized were so close to extinction and that you just don't hear about it because yeah. we are a little desensitized, I think, to hearing about here's another species that's this close to extinction. It's really unfortunate. I think you can get desensitized or numb to this, but, uh, you know, one of my, what I hope um, will be a kind of takeaway from people, for people from the book is how many owls are threatened by habitat destruction and climate change and, and how important it is to really try to work to make sure that our, our children and our children's children get to see the owls that we see and to learn from them because, you know, we're still very much in, in learning mode. And they have such marvelous and mysterious ways of being. So we have, a, you know, a long way to go. I think what we all really crave, especially now, is a is kind of a sense of aliveness and of wonder and awe. And I do think that owls offer that. And um, you know, they they enchant us and they remind us that we're part of something bigger. And we want to have them around for a very long time. So we all need to to lean in and recognize they need support and support them in whatever ways we can. Absolutely. This sort of segues into what I wanted to talk about next, which is if who are you hoping finds this book? If they're walking into a bookstore and maybe this is not their you know normal thing, but if they encounter this book, what are you really looking for people to take away from this? I'm hoping that somebody who walks into the bookstore is going to look at this little northern Selwet owl on the cover and say, oh, my goodness, this owl is looking like straight at me. It has something to tell me. And it does, you know, just I want them to see owls with just a new curiosity and awe. And also, um, after the, reading the book, to think of, of owls as these really subtle um, ingenious, uh, idiosyncratic, and just, you know, just utterly fascinating creatures, and um, and also maybe to to question uh, whether owls might be showing us ways, different ways of knowing and being in the the world, different kinds of intelligence, and to just care more about about their survival. I love that. I think all of those things and more will be so apparent to people when they read this book. As you were writing and as you were researching, was there something that really surprised you? Something that you're like, I can't believe that this is the way it is. Yeah, the vocalization certainly did. But then there's a little bird um, called the burrowing owl, which actually burrows. It nests in the burrows of other animals like prairie dogs, armadillos, uh, woodchucks. Um, but the, <laughs> the really cool thing about these birds that just blew me away was that they decorate their burrows. Um, and they decorate them with all kinds of things. Um, they decorate them with dung, you know, cattle dung and coyote scat. They decorate them with little pieces of fabric and corn stalks. And the males, they do this after the female has already uh, laid her eggs and she's in the burrow. So it's not about attracting a female. But the male does all this, gathers all this stuff around him, sometimes like pieces of concrete. I mean, you just can't believe what they bring and they just lay out around the mouth of the burrow. The, these males are doing it to say, this place is mine. <laughs> so nobody come anywhere near it. It's a flag to other members of the species that that, that that home is taken and that this guy is tough, you know, that he can collect all this stuff. And if you want to be tough in the burrowing owl world, decorate. <laughs> I love that. I think the thing that got me the most, because so often we talk about owls as like these majestic creatures and then they're like but they also play they 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 have fun and they just mess around sometimes and like 
they'll play with each other or they'll play with a cat or they'll play with things on the ground. I was like, I love that. That's yeah, adorable. That surprised me too. There was a barn owl that, that um, played, clearly was playing with a cat. There was nothing um, predator prey about the relationship at all. They were just having a good time together. And um, it's true in the in the animal world at large, you know, in, the, in my last book, I wrote about play in birds and all kinds of birds play. And it's such a sign of um, intelligence and, you know, and and also being um, feeling safe and comfortable in their habitat. So mm -hmm. it's a it's really a beautiful phenomenon. And, and um, I once ran across a um, a group of vultures down the road from me and they were pushing a, a yellow soccer ball around I mean, for no apparent reason but it was just the most fun to watch it's really it, it, it's truly softened me to birds reading this book because i used to be like i don't want them near me i don't want to know about them they freak me out but I'm I'm coming around. I'm I'm softening on them. <laughs> well, you are my audience, Jenna. <laughs> um, because I'm a bookseller, I also have to ask: as you're writing and as you're reading, sort of, who are your author inspirations, or who do you look to to sort of yeah. get you going in this in this vein? Yeah. Well, my original inspiration was Rachel Carson when I uh, wrote my first book, um, Notes from the Shore. I read Rachel Carson just avidly and she has such a lyrical style and, and, and beautiful way of storytelling. So she was my, really my original inspiration, but there's so many great writers now who um, I really admire. Uh, I love Ed Young's work. Immense um, World was just a, a real favorite of mine. David Haskell's uh, Sounds Wild and, and Broken. Uh, just a brilliant book. As far as birds go, um, it, uh, Jonathan Slatt's Owls of the Eastern Ice is, is, is about the Blackestons fish owl. And it's just a magnificent uh, piece of storytelling about his research on the, those owls. Um, and uh, another one is Jonathan Myberg's A Most Remarkable Creature about caracaras, which are very intriguing, intelligent birds. So there's so much great uh, work going on. And, and uh, you know, I find all of it very very inspiring and and um yeah motivating i'll have to get the book on the the blackestons fish owl because again i think they are my new my new favorite so oh, i really will love it i it's, gotta know more yeah it's great my i want to end on something that i've been thinking about this whole time that i've been dying to ask which is obviously for people like me that are not bird people what is your ultimate bird fact to lure in a skeptic well let me just tell you briefly about a bird called the kia, which is a parrot in New Zealand. And this bird is about as close to a child as you will see in the animal world. It is absolutely incredibly playful, incredibly bold, smart, cute. It, I had an, the great joy of meeting these birds in an aviary once. And the researchers said, take off your earrings, take off your, your watch, take everything off because they're going to explore you all of you. And I did, I took, you know, everything off. I come into the aviary and these little birds, little green parrots came flocking to me. Like I, like, like I was an ant bringing them presents, you know, they were just all over and they hopping up on my shoulders. And what I'd forgotten about was that my sneakers and they, they went after my shoelaces, you know, unraveling them. And, but they are absolutely charming birds and they did remind me so much of children and and I just fell in love on the spot so they're um renowned for their play and also for their capacity to collaborate to work together on things so I just think that's pretty magnificent in the bird world <laughs> I love that I think that yeah that get, that got me I'm I'm coming around on birds and <laughs> it is so much to do with this incredible book what an owl knows Jennifer thank you so much for joining us today um, I can't wait for everyone to pick up this book. Uh, I can't wait for them to pick up your other books on birds once they finish this one and they're drawn into this world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenna. It was a great joy. Hello, readers. It's time for another TBR Top Off. We're going to recommend a couple of fantastic books to go along with What an Owl Knows by Jennifer Ackerman. I'm Mark. I'm coming to you from my Barnes & Noble in Cincinnati, and I'm joined by two fantastic book buddies. We've got Madison in Los Angeles, California, and we've got Mary in Beaumont, Texas. 
Madison, why don't you go ahead and kick us off today? I would love to. So when I was thinking of a book to recommend along with this one, I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest nonfiction reader. So I went with a book that I think is still very topical when dealing with the environment and has that good fiction quality that keeps me going. And that is Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey. In this story, you have a woman who is trying to rehabilitate wolves into the Scottish kind of highlands. So her and her team of biologists, it's her, her sister, and this whole team are trying to rehabilitate 14 wolves. And to do so, you can just tell that our main character, Inti Flynn, is so, so passionate about her knowledge in wolves, about rehabilitating these animals, giving them the lives that they deserve. But through the story, it kind of goes awry when a farmer is found dead and the townspeople are really, really quick to blame these new wolves that are now in their territory, essentially. So through this, you see our main character. She's being very passionate. She doesn't believe they did this. You can tell this author did a lot, a lot of research when it comes to wolves and how they act. And then she also did a very fantastic job playing that into our main character. You can kind of see the parallelism between like the environment and how These wolves are predators, how they act, how they rehabilitate back into the environment, and how they then thrive in that environment. And I think you also see that in our main character as she deals with things that are happening within her life and her backstory. So I think McConaughey does a really, really nice job at those parallels, because I think from a person, if you're a person who loves nonfiction and wants to learn more about the environment and nature, and specifically animals, I think this is a good pick for you because you will learn that if you're a fiction fan, it also has everything you want from fiction books because of the tie-in between the wolves and our main character. I think the parallels and how it is written, again, is so, so, like, kind of magical and done really, really well. It has educational value. It has suspense value. It has a little bit of everything you want. And again, I think this shows a real insight as someone who like really finds, I don't know, I'm fascinated by wolves. I found this book fascinating because I got to learn about them as an animal, but also have everything I want in a fiction book, which is why I am recommending Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey. Always a good pick. I'm always excited to talk about that author, Madison. Um, And Migrations are both just stunners. And the way that she braids the natural world with beautiful prose and character work is always, always a delight. So nice pick. Mary, what do you have for us today? My pick goes along with um, the natural world. It is called The Field Guide to Dumb Birds of North America by Matt Cracked. I pulled this out when I first received it, and it was just so funny. It's informative. It shows you migration paths. It gives you birding tips. It gives every bird a very snarky nickname. They have genus and species, but they also have a nickname. This is a great gift for a birder or somebody even for just a humor book. It's informative. It's very, very funny. It's for fans of George Carlin or Bill Burr. They inform you, but it's hilarious at the same time. So this is definitely the book for them and a great gift book. And, you know, you take this out in the field with you, you're going to laugh, but you don't need to laugh when you're birding. You're scared <laughs> away. It's an all around good book. It, it covers, you know, the nature aspect. It also covers the humor aspect. And if I'm going to go for something, I'm always going to try to pick something funny. So my pick and recommendation is The Field Guide of Dumbers of North America. Such a fun book. It uh, makes me giggle every page I turn to. So nice choice. Mm-hmm. And I love this. Uh, two great picks that are two very different. I did want to do a special shout out because I'm reading the book right now, but I am devouring Braiding Sweetgrass by Bridget Wall Kemmerer. A little different because it doesn't have as much to do with animals, but it just is sinking me into the natural world, which makes me so excited for a new book by Ackerman because The Genius of Birds was one of my favorites from a couple of years back. So great picks all around. Thank you both so much. But that is all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for tuning in to Port Over. Please make sure to give us a rating and subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can also follow us on our socials at Barnes & Noble. Pretty simple. I'm Mark. You can follow my home store at BN Westchester. Madison, where can we find you? You can find my home store at BN Events Grove. And Mary, where can we find your store? You can find my home store at BN and Beaumont TX. All right, gang. Thanks for tuning in. Happy reading, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you for listening. Poured Over is a Barnes & Noble production. 
To help other readers find us, please rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts.